We're live? Excellent. All right, uh, welcome to the Tuesday afternoon lunch session. Uh, my name is Jeff Jarman and I'm the director of the Elliott School of Communication. And uh, I'm here to do our introduction. And let me say, uh, having taught um, speech communication for a number of years, I know, I know very much that you are not here to listen to me talk today. <laughs> but I do want to take a couple of minutes in public to thank a number of people before we get to our featured speaker for the day. So uh, first, if you will bear with me, let me thank a number of people. I want to thank um, Amy and Jessica and Madeline, especially as three faculty members who led our initiative to put Com Week together. So thank, the, thank you three and everybody else who helped. But I, I, I want to pay special attention to, to those three. I also, I don't know if there are people here from Shocker Ad Lab or from Jessica's production class. I know there's several from the production class, but thank, thanks to you all, we have great swag, great posters, videos to go with everything we're doing. We could not make Communication Week happen uh, without the faculty and the students who, who do that. And so I very much appreciate the programs. I'm sure I lost, some, yeah, I left some other things out. My own is gonna go through the, the <laughs> list of things that, uh, that I am quite thankful for. I also, while I called out three faculty members in particular, I wanna take a, a moment to thank the faculty of the Elliott School. I was looking to see if we had any grad, uh, graduate teaching assistants in here. I don't think we have any. I just wanna thank the faculty at the, uh, in the department uh, we are very fortunate to have an amazing group of faculty that work incredibly hard, who I know are passionate and care very much about the students. And, and I just want to take a minute to publicly thank them for all that they do. I know it is an incredible amount of work, and I know they love the students and they love what they do. So thank you all for everything that you do. Uh, I, I also want to, I don't know that everybody knows, but we have two new assistant professors in the department this year. And I want to highlight Hannah and Phil as two of our brand new uh, assistant professors in the department. Uh, if you've had the opportunity to take classes from them, I know you know how happy we are that they are here. And if you have not, I promise they will be teaching a bunch more in the coming <laughs> semesters and you will have the opportunity to, to work with them uh, in the very near future. So thanks to, to everyone, our, our adjuncts and our GTAs and everyone who, who teach the classes for us. It is uh, my great honor today to introduce our um, speaker. Uh, I first met Matt when he came to Wichita State to pursue a master's in communication. And it is an interesting story and one that I think in hindsight reflects incredibly poorly <laughs> on us. Uh, as I recall, we admitted Matt on probation. And that means that we, it turns out this is crazy. We had a graduate coordinator at the time, somebody who's not here with us any longer, so I can say anything bad about them that I want to. Yeah, that's right. But we had a graduate coordinator at the time who was an incredible stickler for whether or not we could admit somebody um, in full, full status as a graduate student. And it turns out that Matt got some other random degree and not a degree in communication. And so there's just no possible chance that Matt could be admitted in full standing because he had not had classes in communication at the time. So uh, he was assigned to take a few classes to uh, make sure he could handle communication. <laughs> and one of those classes was my communication 535 class. Uh, and Matt was in that class. It became apparent right away that our graduate school admissions criteria was in desperate need of revision. <laughs> it was immediately obvious that Matt was not just capable of pursuing a degree in communication. He was and, and is obviously incredibly smart and hardworking and driven. Uh, not only did Matt earn his degree without any difficulty, he then served as an adjunct for us uh, to teach immediately following grad school. And in what is now a fitting into this story, uh, at least to me, we forced Matt, I know that if you've had 535, you, you will sympathize with that. We forced Matt to take 535 in order to prove that he was capable of doing uh, you know, study and communication but he distinguished himself so early and so quickly that we immediately hired him to teach COM 535 <laughs> as soon as he was done with his degree. Uh, he left 
uh, the university uh, working with us a short time after that, has had an incredibly distinguished career with the National Park Service, uh, 24 years and counting now, serves as the superintendent of one of our national parks. I think he's going to document many of um, his, uh, his career journey over, over the last 24 years, but it is my incredible honor to welcome today our 2021 Outstanding Alum, Matt Blythe. Hey everybody. <laughs> so I'll tell you a little more of why I was on probation later. Um, and, and honestly, it was probably the best thing in the world that I was put into Jeff's class and I was also put into uh, Professor Pat Dooley's history of communication class. Um, it was a real awakening for me to know that I was where I needed to be in life. Because my family, we always debated around the coffee table or the dining room table about pol political things and had ar you know argumentative type of debates. And I'm a history lover, so you'll you'll see a little more of that. Um, so when Jeff told me, called me to tell me I was the outstanding alum, I was like, "Is this a prank call?" <laughs> um, he did say, you know. This is the good news. The bad news is you have to speak. Um, and I will admit to you all that um, I did what, and I've taught public speaking uh, at University of Central Oklahoma. I didn't do it here. Um, I, I have done everything I tell my students not to do. I did this quickly. I put this PowerPoint together like in 24 hours, the last 24 hours, not just in 24 hours, the last 24 hours. Um, and there's nothing more nerve wracking, obviously, than to give a speech uh, in front of a bunch of calm people, right? Because you all know what you're supposed to be doing right, what you're supposed to be doing wrong, or what, what is wrong. Um, so I don't know if I should have admitted that I put the final touches on this this morning, um, but I did. Um, Honestly, I'm very, I, I will get a little teary. I'm an old fart and I get uh, real sentimental. I've always been kind of a sentimental person, but I'm, I'm truly humbled to be the outstanding alum. Um, I will also tell you today is my birthday. Oh. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm 56 years old today. And this kind of ties into what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm a late bloomer. And being a late bloomer, there, uh, you know, there's some societal pressures. I was reading, trying to do a little uh, research before I started, you know, thinking about what am I going to talk about. And I thought, you know, there's nothing wrong with being a late bloomer, but evidently there is some <laughs> discussion about whether calling people late bloomers is good or not. Um, found an article uh, online from the BBC. Uh, many of us feel either consciously or otherwise that our paths should fit into a rigid timeline of professional and personal milestones. We may judge ourselves negatively if we hit these milestones late, in part because of a societal ten tendency to generate youthful achievement. Well, I didn't come to Wichita State until my late 30s. I graduated just shortly before I turned 40. Um, so that was a late blooming thing. Um, and I'm going to try to do this little analogy through this talk. It may not work because I'm uh, uh, talking about late blooming and plants, right? I'm not, a, I have no green thumb. I kill things that are green. Um, but I think there's something to late blooming plants. And you heard it in the last, uh, the previous speaker, for those of you who are here, she was really dynamic. I really, I would go back and watch her online. Um, she touched on a few things that I may be touching on uh, in, in some life lessons. But one of those is, I think, being a late bloomer, um, you build resilience. And resilience is a really important uh, trait to develop. 
and it can be developed. And I think I've developed it through my, my life. So uh, playing on that analogy, I'll talk about my seedling years. Um, I was born in Memphis, Tennessee, almost 56 <laughs> years ago to the minute. Not quite. Oh, Siri's thinking I'm telling her something. Um, I was the third child. Um, I was an oops child. I have brothers who are nine and 10 years older than I am. I once asked my parents, I said, was that a mistake? And God loved my mother. Rest her soul. She said, no, you were a pleasant surprise. <laughs> um, but I had really wonderful parents who instilled in me a love of learning and a love of adventure, a love of travel. As I talked about, we spent our evenings oftentimes around the dinner table debating the news of the world, kind of what, what was what. And I have to admit, um, you know, I was the kind of the black sheep in a lot of the thought processes around the table. Um, I often saw things from a different side than my family. Uh, and that's why I knew I was in the right place when I got into Jess class. Because it's like, yes, we were talking about this last night. You know, I, I want to be precise, right? Being precise is good. Um, but my parents, we, we, because I was an oops child, my brothers were out of the household. I, had, I was almost like an only child. We traveled around the country. We got to go to a lot of state and national parks. We had a camper. So it instilled in me also a love of nature and the outdoors and a love of history. My dad was a big his, history guy. And, um, so now to kind of maybe why I was put on probation. <laughs> High school, I went to a private school, it was a great experience, but I was in the third quartile. I wasn't the smartest kid in the class. Went to college, I went to college in Virginia. Uh, back then it was called Mary Washington College, it's now the University of Mary Washington. And I got an undergraduate degree in historic preservation. Um, I found that I loved history, but I couldn't figure out what you could do with a history degree besides teach. Although I now know there are a lot of things you can do with a history degree besides teach. But back then, I didn't quite get it. And I really loved old buildings. Um, so went to Mary Washington, had a lot of fun. <laughs> I had a lot of fun. My GPA, when I graduated, was 2.56. So that's why when the graduate coordinator at the time saw that I had a 2.56. I'd been out of college for a while. They put me on probation. But another running thing that I hope you'll all kind of take away um, is things happen for a reason in life. You may not always understand it, but things happen for a reason. And I think part of that probationary period was to put me into just class in the Dr. Dooley's class, so that I would be like, man, where has this been all my life? Why did I not know about communication when I was in high school? But all things come in good time. Um, I will say, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a certified public accountant, like my dad. Learned very quickly that is not what I wanted to do. I became a golfer, and man, my dad couldn't play golf in the springtime because of, right, April 15th tax deadline. Um, and I think, you know, we all learn a lot about what we need to be doing by finding out what we don't need to be doing. And I think I learned, even though it was probably the motive to play golf wasn't the right reason not to go into accounting for me. <laughs> but it, it did direct me in a different uh, path for life. I, when I was in college, I had a professor who said to me, hey, the National Park Service is recru recruiting on campus today. Now, I went to school in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and my campus was actually on the site of part of the Battle of Fredericksburg from the Civil War. And he said, I think you'd really be good at that job. So I went and talked to the recruiter. And back in those days, so he was recruiting for summer jobs, 
which is a great way to get into the Park Service. I know we have some park students here, and I'm really glad to see you guys. Happy to answer your questions, uh, you know, any, any that you have for getting into the National Park Service. Um, but so I went and talked to this recruiter, right? And he told me, oh, well, you can apply for a summer seasonal job at two national parks every year. And back then, it was a very long, arduous paper application. Um, and he also told me, you know, most people, they want to work in Yellowstone, right? That's everybody's dream, right? Yellowstone, Yosemite, the big Y parks, as we call them. He said, but you'd have a better chance if you try a small historical park. And I thought, well, that's exactly where I want to be anyway. I like history. So I applied for uh, two spots. I applied at Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania National Battlefield, and I applied at Arlington House, the Robert E. Lee Memorial, which sits in the middle of Arlington National Cemetery. Um, and I have a little graphic of DC. I don't have an I don't have a picture of Arlington House that's not old school three by five photo. Um, so I haven't scanned those yet. So this is anybody know what that is? Lincoln Memorial, thank you. Taken from uh, the Washington Monument. If you go over that bridge and look up the hill, you'd see Arlington House. Um, so I applied for Arlington House. I was offered a job. Unfortunately, that first summer, I couldn't take the job because I was in a wedding at West Point, and they were training the same week that I was in the wedding. So the next, they said, please apply next year. I applied. I did a summer season as a, as a park ranger at Arlington House. And anybody been to DC and done the tour through Arlington National Cemetery on the little tour mobile bus, right? Goes around. And in the summertime, those tour mobile buses come pretty frequently and they drop about 40 or 50 to 80 people off at a time. And at Arlington House, um, if you've ever been in that house, it's a big center hallway designed to catch the breeze that comes up the hill off the Potomac. We'd fit 40 people in the middle of this hallway, and we'd talk to them. We'd give a 10-minute talk, and then they would be able to wander around the house. Um, just a funny story, one of the probably the most interesting things that happened to me that summer is I had a woman who was pregnant who passed out on me in the middle of my talk. And, you know, nothing like giving a speech and somebody just over on the floor in the heat. Um, but it taught me, again, a little bit of resilience. Your audience, they may keel over on you sometimes. That's OK. Um, but to kind of continue this theme of being a late bloomer and talking about plants, a lot of what I have experienced in my career and in my life, frankly, has been organic growth and organic in nature. So. I wasn't planning on going into the park service. I'd been to lots of national parks, thought it was cool. I'd met national park rangers and state park rangers and thought, that's the coolest job ever. But I didn't really have a notion of where I wanted to go until my professor said, I think you'd be really good at that. So I kind of went with it. Sometimes, just a side note here, sometimes, you know, the, the, the growth was above ground and visible had a lot of good growth, you know, buds coming out on the edges. But sometimes the growth wasn't visible. And it was through, all, as the previous speaker kind of talked about, some of those hard times when you start kind of going farther down into ground, in the ground and you develop your roots. So I've had both of those in my career. And as Jeff mentioned, I've had 24 years in the Park Service total, actually. If I, so I've, I was in the Park Service for 10 years, and I left for 10 years, and then I've been back in for about 14. Um, so, you know, some of it's been easy, some of it hasn't been. One thing I can tell you, even though it's not always, ro you know, sunshine and roses, they talk about park, park rangers being paid in sunsets. We, Park rangers don't often make the most money. We're on a government scale, but they don't make the best pay all the time. We live in some remote places sometimes. Some people love that, but it's hard for people. But we're really fortunate because, you know, I go to work every day and I get to work in a place where people go to vacation. 
You think about that. How lucky is that? People take off of their jobs to come to where I work. Not a bad gig. But so I was at Arlington House. Um, I worked on the George Washington Memorial Parkway, which is a road that runs along the Potomac for a while. I worked in the Washington office of the Park Service. Anybody um, ever go old school and watch the old Kim Burns Civil War series? Anybody watch that? So if you've ever watched that series, I worked down the hall from one of the guys who was the, one of the commentary people on there, Edward Bars. He's, a, he's now deceased, but he was a great Civil War historian. And Ed Bars, quite a character, would come down the hallway. And here I am, I'm, I'm like in my early 20s, right? This is, I'm like 24 years old. How are you today? And he talked to me, and, oh, and he had this very gruff voice like this. Well, and when he was done talking to you, all he would say was, thank you very much, thank you. And he'd just walk away, right? So I got to, I've worked with some really interesting people, and I've worked in some really interesting places. I worked on the Natchez Trace Parkway, which runs through Alabama, Tennessee, and Mississippi. Um, so I'm from Memphis, I mentioned that. And I hope whoever might be live streaming this or watches it later doesn't get offended. I'm from Memphis, and everything bad in Memphis happens because it's somebody from Mississippi coming into Memphis to do it. <laughs> so I was working in the Washington office of the Park Service, and this is another kind of organic thing that happened. The Park Service started uh, this whole thing called Operation Opportunity. They were downsizing central offices, and I was in the central office for the Park Service. And what they could, you could do is you could, take, um, you could take your resume and put it into a pile, basically, and Parks could call you. So if you were a central office person, you could put your resume in and Parks could call you and ask if you'd be interested in maybe taking a job in a park. So they wouldn't have to advertise for a job. And there's a whole thing about government. If you want to know about government hiring, we, can, we could do a whole session on how, how that goes. But So I put my name in the hat, you know, just thinking, I'll throw my resume in, and I got a call from the Natchez Trace Parkway. And they said, hey, we have this job. It's uh, an interpreter, which is, those are the people who, on, in, when you go into a national park, they're the people who talk to you, right? <laughs> they tell you the stories of the park. I'd done that at Arlington House. The person also would kind of take care of museum collections, and I'd done that also at Arlington House. I'd worked in the curatorial part of the, the offices. And then they would take care of the library. And that's kind of what I did at, uh, in the Washington office. I had a repository of books. And we wouldn't call it a library because it wasn't cataloged to library standards. But I took care of about, well, books for all the national parks and national park system related to cultural resources. So I thought, well, that sounds great. And, well, the job's in Tupelo, Mississippi. Mm, OK. <laughs> so they said, we'd really love it if you, you know, throw your resume in the hat for this job. And I'm like, okay, I'll do that. Then I started thinking about it. Mississippi, not where I wanna go. Everything bad comes from Mississippi. They call me back. They tell me more about the job. Yeah, okay, okay, that, yeah, all right. Yeah, I, I'll put in for it. Slept on it, woke up, nope, nope, not what I want to do. They call me back again. They call me back and they say, hey, we still haven't received your resume. I don't lie very well, and I don't like to lie. I mean, you know, we all tell little white lies, but I'm not, I just tend to not lie. I don't like to lie. But I don't know what happened to me that day, but I said, you haven't gotten my resume? <laughs> well, I sent, I, can't, I sent it a while back. Well, no, we haven't. Can you fax it to us? And I said, well, I don't have it with me today. <laughs> well, can you send, fax it tomorrow? I'm like, yeah, sure. Now, a government resume is not a two-page or one-page thing. A government resume is more like a curriculum vitae, multiple pages. You have to like tell them the last time you chewed gum, you know, where you went to uh, nursery school. I mean, the whole nine yards, right? So I went home that night 
and I did my application, my resume, and I faxed it in. And two hours later, I had that job. And I tell this story because, you know, you're going to resist some things, that, opportunities that come your way. I obviously was resisting this one. But it ended up being probably one of the best working experiences for me. Because I went there, and my boss, who actually also came out of the Washington office like a month after I did, she moved down, and uh, she was a journalism major in college. And she was a great writer, and a lot of my job was doing writing. And I learned a lot from her. I learned that I was a pretty good writer. And I would give her things for review, um, come back with lots of red on it. And it became my uh, goal to, you remember the old Visine commercials? Get the red out. It's like, I'm going to get the red out of this. I'm going to keep honing my writing skills until I get the red out. And it was really at the Natchez Trace that I learned that I'm a pretty good communicator. So if I hadn't been at the Natchez Trace Parkway, I might not have ever thought about applying for this program at WSU, honestly. From Mississippi, I moved to Boston. And I, went, uh, I, was, I became a manager of an interpretation program at two national park sites, the uh, Frederick Law Olmsted National Historic Site and the John F. Kennedy National Historic Site, which is where John F. Kennedy was born. Frederick Law Olmsted is the man who designed Central Park. If you don't know, he's a very prolific landscape architect, um, really interesting individual. Um, I didn't stay there that long, but it was in the Boston area, so a drastic change from Mississippi, obviously. Um, then I left the Park Service. Also another faded type of thing, probably. I left the Park Service because I fell in love. We can have a whole conversation about falling in love, but that's not another thing. <laughs> but that falling in love brought me to Kansas because the woman that I met uh, lived here in Kansas. Um, I moved to Newton, so about 30 minutes up the road. And I lived in Newton. Great. We, she was a State Farm insurance agent. So I got, I got licensed. We ran this business. I got licensed in insurance. I always tell people, you know, um, for me, and I give, like, like to the people from Mississippi, any insurance agents, I apologize who are watching. <laughs> for me, Doing insurance was like living in purgatory or hell. It just wasn't, it wasn't a thing that fed my soul. It's a very necessary thing to have. So do not go without insurance. Um, if my partner at the time had not decided to go back to school, I might not have ended up here as well. So we were running this state farm insurance business. It didn't feed her soul either, obviously. She went back to school to become a marriage and family therapist. Uh, she had kids. They were all in school. I'm thinking, huh, everybody else is in school. Why don't I go back to school? So I started looking into Wichita State. I knew I was a pretty decent writer. I knew I wasn't creative enough to be like, write the great American novel, not that guy. <laughs> And I started researching the Elliott School. And it, again, was a life-changing experience. Probation or not, it was, it was good. But I'll tell you more about Elliott School in a minute. I want to kind of, I'm going to gloss over it. So I'd been a State Farm agent for about five years, came here, um, had time here. I will say, I may mention this again later, I graduated with a 4.0 from here. <laughs> and I do think, um, and I'm you know, going to shout out from the mountaintops that the faculty here, wonderful, right? I think that's part of the reason. Cohort, and I'll tell you more about a couple of folks over here in a minute, um, you know, having that cohort of people to go through this experience with was also wonderful. Um, anyway, I decided I'd go pursue a PhD 
that didn't work out. And I'll touch on that later too. Things sometimes don't fit. This fit, that didn't, where I went. So I went back to the park service. Now I left the park service as a manager. When I went back to the, into the park service, I came back as, uh, so anybody know about government pay scales? So I was a GS 11 when I left the park service. I came back into the park service 10 years later as a GS five, basically an entry level position. I took a job at the Oklahoma city national Memorial. And, um, when I was interviewed for that job, the woman who was interviewing me said, you do know this is an entry level job, don't you? And I said, yes, I do. I said, you know, I've lived through my own purgatory in hell. I've discovered what feeds my soul. And I would rather be doing something that feeds my soul. And let me say insurance can make, you can make really great money with insurance. I said, I'd rather be doing something that feeds my soul than making lots of money. I want to get up out of bed every day and love what I do. So pardon me, I have all my notes on my phone. I did this yesterday, like I said, on the plane. So um, <laughs> make sure I'm touching on everything. So then she also asked me, she said later, well, if you had stayed in the National Park Service, you might have been a superintendent by now, which is the park manager. So there are like 423 units in the National Park System, and all of them are led by park superintendents. And I said, yeah, that, that might have been if I'd stayed in, but I want to be here. And I spent five years at the Oklahoma City National Memorial. I was down on the ground giving programs, telling people as an interpreter, you know, they call, you know, they call them sometimes sages on the stage. Um, we try, we're trying to get away from that in the park service now, do a little more audience centered stuff. Um, telling a very hard story. I'm very passionate. If you, uh, if you followed me on social media, uh, you would see I'm very passionate about federal service. Um, Anybody been to the Oklahoma City National Memorial? Been to the memorial, how powerful it is. That memorial is to 168 people who were killed by an American terrorist. An anti-government American terrorist didn't like the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, didn't like the FBI, didn't like, uh, there's another one and all of a sudden it left my mind. Um, those law enforcement agencies. Very big Second Amendment person, nothing wrong with that, right? That is a right to own guns. But this individual had kind of gone overboard and decided that he would bomb a federal office building. And he, was, he had looked at a number of different ones, just so you know. He had a criteria. He had to have two of the three law enforcement agencies he hated in it, like office in there. Had to be close to an interstate so he could get away. Easy to pull up and park next to the building with a rider truck full of explosives, which is what he did. He pulled up in a rider truck, left the truck there, walked away. That bomb went off. 168 people were killed. Many other lives were affected for, you know, because it wasn't just that building you know, Oklahoma a little bit, people as far as Stillwater, and even I've heard people from Tulsa say, I felt the effects of that bomb. I felt the shockwaves that day. And I'm sure there are people probably in Wichita who might even claim to have felt it. It affected a lot of people. He walked away, right? So I'm telling this story, and it's all because he was angry at the government. So I'm getting a little bit on my soapbox right now and diverging a little bit from what I was going to talk about it. Everything in life is organic for me, so I'm sorry. Um, he killed 19 children. Many of them were in a daycare that was in the building. He killed mothers and fathers. There were married couples who perished that day together, right? All because he was angry at the government. 
And I like to relate this to the Elliott School in this regard. I think, and, and you all are growing up in a time where we, there's, it's very divisive, right? We don't seem to be able to have communication with each other. That's where we're able to, to say, I don't agree with you and that's okay without yelling at each other and saying, you are a bad person because you disagree with me. And I like to tell, especially young kids who may, maybe didn't understand why this memorial was here. You know, they're young, they don't understand the violence that goes along with it. But I always would say, you know, do you disagree with your brother sometimes? Yeah, yeah. Do you hit your brother sometimes? Yeah. I said, how does that work? How does that work out for you? Not so good, right? We have to find a way to communicate. And you're gaining those skills here to communicate. So I see all of you and I see my role in the world is to help communicate and bridge some differences instead of, instead of using violent means to disagree. My, my compadres over here, Sandy, and, and Eric um, were in grad school when I was in grad school. We hung out together. Um, we had a wonderful professor, Vernon Keel. Now, he was the first Elliott School director. And he, I was in his last uh, comms 801 class. Don't ask me what the title of that class was, but was it theory? Comms, comms? Research methods. Research methods. Okay. Thank you. Old can't remember things. And we read this article by Barnett Pierce called Dialogue with the Other. And it's one that I would suggest, it's, it's an academic article, you may not like academic ar articles like I do, but I would suggest that you go and find it and read it because it's all about how communication works. So I'm sorry, I've digressed a little bit. So I was at the Oklahoma City National Memorial, I don't have one of those either, um, for five years. And I became a manager, uh, the supervisory park ranger there. So I, came back up as I worked there. And then I was part of a leadership cohort called Goal Academy, Generation, Generating organize, Organizational Advancement and Leadership. So it was for up and coming leaders. And I went to this class, it was a six, six on-site things. And I'm gonna tell you, one of the beauties also of being in the park service, we have classes in some really cool places. <laughs> um, my first time to go to the Grand Canyon was for this class. Got to go to San Francisco if you've ever been out to Alcatraz. That's a national park site. Um, went down to the border in Arizona, Oregon Pipe Cactus, um, where a lot of bad stuff happens, but it, it's a beautiful place. Um, went through this class, and there was m a, a moment, or five or six or seven or eight, that I was sitting in this class thinking, why am I here? Sorry, I'm doing what she did before I'm hitting that. <laughs> Why am I here? Why am I in this class? I'm not a leader. All these other people are leaders, but why am I here? I've suffered throughout my career and throughout my life probably with imposter syndrome. Wondering why am I in the place I'm at when I'm around so many other accomplished, smart, beautiful people, right? Why am I here? But coming out of that class, I realized I'm here because we, call, we all can step up into leadership roles, wherever we are, right? You can be, I could have been still a GS5 park ranger and stepped up and been a leader. And I realized that I love the National Park Service and if I really wanted to affect change in the Park Service, that I needed to continue to try to step up. So I applied for um, what we call a detail, um, a temporary acting assignment as a superintendent. And I went out to um, ah, one of the most beautiful places. I went out to Washita Battlefield National Historic, Historic Site, which is in far western rural Oklahoma. Unfortunately, I, I wasn't picking happy stories though. This is another sad story to tell, but an important one. This is a site, uh, an Indian Wars site. If you've ever heard of Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer, 
This was his first Indian battle, basically, where he and his 7th Cavalry came upon the sleeping band of the Cheyenne Peace Chief, Black Kettle. Now, Black Kettle and his people had been attacked like almost four years to the day earlier at a place called Sand Creek, which is now a National Park unit as well. Sand Creek Massacre National Historic Site. Many people died at Sand Creek. The Cheyenne, the Arapaho, many other Plains Indian tribes were kind of being pursued, hunted, driven out by the United States government because of westward expansion. And I, I use several words because words, as you know, matter. Even the name of this park, Washita Battlefield National Historic Site, if you talk to Cheyenne and Arapaho who uh, have ancestors who perished here, they would say that was not a battle. It was a massacre. So I've used the words battlefield. And it, it has that name because of the way the legislation was done. Every park is brought into the, United, uh, the national park system through legislation or the president deems it a national monument. And we use that as the guide for how we operate each park. So it came in under um, the American Battlefield Protection Act or program. So it's Washita Battlefield, even though many people consider it Washita Massacre. So how you view what happened to the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, other Plains tribes is also a matter of semantics. Were they hunted? Were they in the wrong? Were they in the right? Was the U.S. government in the wrong? Were they in the right? That's where communication is really interesting because you can debate those things. You can talk about those things. Anyway, not the happiest story because in the end, Black Kettle, again, he was a peace chief, had signed peace treaties with the United States government. Black Kettle, his wife, and many of his band were killed that day. Numbers vary because the U.S. government, uh, the soldiers who were there, said over 100 Indians were killed. Cheyenne and Arapaho say about 40. Regardless, it's a horrible incident. If you know anything about, uh, what do you know about Custer? Anybody know about Custer's last stand? Egomaniac. Egomaniac, very arrogant. His wife really was, his wife was a great PR person, especially after his death, by the way. If you're looking for something interesting to research and study, that might be a really cool one. It's a study, Libby Armstrong, and how she kept her husband's memory alive after he was killed at Little Bighorn. Um, he tried the same tactics at Little Bighorn that he used at Washita. And the only reason it didn't work at Washita is because Black Kettle and his band we're camped along the Washita River, which is kind of along this tree line back here. They were camped farther away from other Plains nations. They started doing that after Sand Creek, so they were a little bit separated. So they wouldn't be a target. And Custer kind of just happened upon them and was able to overtake them. Well, Custer tried the same tactics at Little Bighorn much larger numbers of uh, tribal uh, representatives at Little Bighorn, and he ended, uh, it met his demise. Anyway, uh, again, I'm giving you a history lesson in the middle of this. I became acting superintendent at Washita, and then I was really fortunate enough to be selected to be the permanent superintendent there at Washita. And Washita, again, it's a beautiful place. It's a very serene and sacred place. If you ever get a chance to go out, please, please do. Um, it looks a little different now. We made some improvements while I was there. There's another shot of the landscape. Um, so I was at Washita for five, a little over five years. Then I went, while I was there, I did another acting assignment at Great Sand Dunes. And this is my right-hand man, Ben. He was my dog. Um, best dog ever. We can debate that, but you will not win. Um, 
went to the Great Sand Dunes. It was supposed to be four months. It ended up being eight months. Um, my wife stayed in Oklahoma. I was in Colorado. Um, loved it there. It was not like anything I'd ever uh, done before. Big natural park. It's a national park and preserve. So part of the uh, park used to be for certain Fish and Wildlife Service. So they actually allow hunting on part of the park that is the preserve part. Um, I thought, what is this place? What are these sand dunes? I really had no concept until I got there. And it's like, it's just an amazing place. I applied for the permanent job there. And you can see the sand dunes in the background, bison. Um, I didn't get that job. Again, you know, sometimes life doesn't give you what you think you want. I really wanted that job. I had done some good work. They had had some, the, the previous manager, the Park Service is uh, like probably a lot of places. But this is pre-COVID, pre so, you know, but we had people leaving, people retiring. We've been having a wave of older people who are retiring. So managers are going into these acting roles and not in their normal jobs. The manager was down at the Grand Canyon, actually, and had been there most of a year. So I was the third person who had come in to be acting in this park. So they hadn't had any stable leadership. I really loved the people. People in the park, they myself on the back, they liked me. You know, they thought I was a pretty good manager, and they really hoped that I had gotten the job, but I didn't. But there's always a reason for not getting things that you think you want. So take that with you for a minute. You may think you want something, and I really wanted that. Oh, that was just amazing. It's like over 300 days of sunshine in Colorado. How could you not want that? But now, this is the official headshot that I could not send to the, uh, I, I work for the federal government, and I have to run things through the ethics office, and they would not let me show you me in uniform as my headshot for this whole thing. But I thought, well, I'll throw it in the slideshow because <laughs> this is what I look like. And, and uh, this was the next park I went to, uh, Ulysses S. Grant National Historic Site. President Grant, probably one of the most uh, underrated presidents there ever was. But if you read about this man, lots of life lessons you can gain from this man, very humble. Had a lot of failure, <laughs> lots of failure. He lived, so he was, he graduated from West Point, was in the Mexican War. A lot of people, uh, when you learn or read about Grant, you, you will learn that he had a drinking problem. Some of that has been overblown through the years. If you ask my staff at Ulysses S. Grant, who are much smarter than I am. Um, he left the Army because he missed his family. His, his wife, his father-in-law owned this bright green house that's behind me. That's where he met her. Three of his four children were born in that house. And when he left the army in the 1854, he came here and thought he would be a farmer. His father-in-law gave him a little land. He built a log cabin. Um, it was very hard times in the late 1850s, hard economic times. He was selling firewood on the streets of St. Louis because this is in suburban St. Louis. This is just a couple of years before he became well-known as a Civil War general. The man never gave up. So when the war broke out, he, he was like, I, you know, I went to West Point. I can help you. I served in the Mexican War. I can help you. Finally rose up through the ranks and he became general of the armies. In fact, uh, I may, be, I may be misstating that. He, Senator Blunt from Missouri and one of the congresswomen, the congresswomen for the district are going to put him in for something that only George Washington and General Pershing have. And I think that is the general of the armies. But he was, he got, he, he's like this amazing man. Go learn about him in history. But So I, I came to Ulysses S. Grant. And it was a, what we call a lateral move. It wasn't a promotion for me. And it was kind of an easy gig. Great staff, really smart people. So if you were ever a boss, here's, here's a little more advice for you, old man advice. Never be afraid to hire people who are smarter than you are. 
I didn't hire them, thankfully they were already there. Never be afraid of that. Even if you're not a boss, surround yourself with really smart, intelligent people. It's only going to enrich you. Because I can tell you, my staff, I, I, could, I could like twiddle my thumbs and they would be doing incredible work. And guess who got the credit for it? I did. I'm not trying to minimize, you know, I think I did an okay job managing, but it's much easier to manage really smart people. Well, most of the time. <laughs> so COVID hit while I was here. I was there for two and a half years. And, you know, a year of it, well, I, I went in January of 2019, COVID hits March of 20, so a year and two months. I left, um, I just left in September, the end of September is when I left that job and I moved to St. Paul, Minneapolis, St. Paul. So I now am the superintendent at Mississippi National River and Recreation Area. It is a 72 mile corridor of the Mississippi River that runs from uh, just north of Minneapolis, south beyond St. Paul to a town called Hastings. So 54,000 acres is within my park boundary, but the National Park Service only owns 50, uh, 92 acres of that 54,000. So guess what that means? That means I have to be really good at communicating with a lot of different people because I don't, I don't have control over a lot of the land that I need to be taking care of. It requires a lot of good communication and I'm still, you know, meeting people, um, learning about them. I do, I will say, I have the coolest job in the world. This is my resource management staff. They took me out on a kayak trip my second week there. Seeing the fall colors, the beauty of uh, the Mississippi River. It's a really cool place. Um, lots of history, lots of beautiful natural scenery. Um, it's just incredible. So I, I really am a lucky guy. So we'll leave that one up because I don't have a lot more. Uh, I have one more slide. I have some maybe advice for you all, a little more advice. But I want to tell you, this is the place where I got a really good dose of fertilizer and lots of watering to continue my plant analogy, to swing back to that. You kind of have my resume. I have, I have an odd resume. I have not had like this solid line trajectory. I thought it was funny when uh, Jessica in the last session said, you know, everybody thinks the line's gonna be straight, the road's gonna be like, you're, you got this clear path. And sometimes it's not that clear. And that's okay. I wouldn't change anything that's happened in my life. I really wouldn't. So, you know, I, I, I moved to Kansas. I told you my, my partner went back to school. Everybody in the household was in school. I decided to come back here to the Elliott School. Figured I could write. I could do research. Yeah, I could do this. And as I said, it was the perfect fit for me. And even saying it's a perfect fit feels like an understatement. Because again, the fertilizer, the, the watering, the nurturing that you get here, I don't know that I've experienced it. I, I went to a PhD program after this and it didn't fit because I felt like I didn't have that same, there wasn't that same cohesiveness. And maybe that's, I don't know, I've, we've got some PhDs in the room. Maybe that's the way it is in a PhD program. I don't believe it has to be that way in life at all, PhD program or not. Here, the cohort that we were together, we were talking about this over uh, the lunch, um, we were there for each other. I can tell you, I will not name a name, but we had a really, one bad, I have one bad professor. One bad professor. <laughs> I wasn't going to name names. <laughs> had one bad professor. And I'll tell you, I would not have gotten through that class without the people sitting around me. We went through it together. 
We studied for comprehensive exams together. We shared peppermint. Peppermint evidently helps the brain. I need some, I need a lot of peppermint these days. I'm not doing so well in the brain department. I'm getting old and forgetful. So why is this old man, this late bloomer, your outstanding alum? I've asked myself that question several times since Jeff made the phone call. Like I said, I've suffered from imposter syndrome. Am I, re who am I? Who am I to be the outstanding alum? I mean, I'm just this guy. I try to do my best. Sometimes my best ain't great, but I try to do my best. You know, I've asked the question many times, who am I to fill the job? Why am I in this leadership role or in this leadership uh, program? And it's taken me a long time to understand that I am worthy of being in these places. But you have to always remember you're not in these places alone. The ESC, the Elliott School, it changed my life. It helped me know that I was worthy, even though I had to go through probation. And Jeff didn't, he didn't, we didn't coordinate this. It's funny that you brought, I mean, you know, who would have guessed that I, the guy who made a 2.56 grade point average in college, would have been the guy who got out of the Elliott School with a 4.0. I never would have told you that I could have done that. I didn't think I was that smart. But the people here helped me see that I was that smart, that I was, I was capable. So I want to share with you, uh, kind of closing up, wrapping up, a few things. I want to plant a few of my own seeds for you. And I will go along with the, the uh, BBC article. Uh, I think what th that article got right is that we all do things on our own time. So to kind of play off of what our previous speaker said, you know, don't put pressure on yourself to do certain things at certain times. Do it on your own time. But these are some things that I've learned. Collaborate. Learned a lot of that here. Like I said, we spent a lot of time as a cohort together, bouncing ideas off of each other, talking about the classes we were taking, about the things we were learning. I am the first person to tell you I hate group projects. Always hated group projects, right? And you're thinking, oh, really? Another group project? Yep, another group project. <laughs> I have to say, it's more like the real world than you really understand. I just, um, I just was a committee chair for a, uh, putting together a senior leadership training for my region of the National Park Service. So I, it was a training for all the, uh, the park superintendents and all of our regional leadership. Um, committee is the big word there, right? Committee, collaboration, working together, communicating. You're always going to have a weak link or two, probably in your group work. You've probably found that out. Do you all like group work, by the way? Maybe you do. Some people do. I didn't. I don't know why. I love people. I'm a big extrovert. I love being around people, but always had anxiety about group things. It's like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't, just let me go do it. It's kind of my, but working in committees, you can get a lot more done. Working in collaboration. And again, the groundwork, the, 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 the foundation that you have, that you're getting from being here you're learning the skills, those communication skills, you're learning kind of the ins and outs to be able to do those things more effectively. The next one is develop a personal mission statement or a leadership philosophy. It's funny how I didn't, I did not know Jess, Jessica, the last speaker, but you know, she kind of, I think touched on this as well. Know your why. Write it down, storyboard it, put it out into the universe. So I told you I was very organic about my career. 
Never really planned where I would go next in the Park Service, except for the job I'm in now. So when I became a superintendent, they put me into a thing called the New Superintendent's Academy. Got to go back to the Grand Canyon. First night in the Grand Canyon after the first day of classes, I'm walking to dinner with the superintendent of the Mississippi National River and Recreation Area. My wife is from Minnesota. My in-laws live in Minnesota. Three of my, uh, well, three of her four, my wife's four siblings live in that, the Twin Cities area. And I knew that's the place we wanted to go. So that night, I was walking to dinner with my colleague who was the superintendent at Mississippi National River and Recreation Area, and I said to him, I want your job someday. I've never done that to anybody, never said it. <laughs> and guess where I am today? I'm in the job that I said I wanted maybe seven years ago, six or seven years ago. COVID time, I, I lost track of, I'm not good with how long it's been, but I put it out in the universe. I've also developed a leadership uh, philosophy I didn't write it down for a number of years, but I, I finally did. And I share that with all, every time I go to a new park, I share my leadership philosophy with the staff. And what that does more than anything is I tell my staff, I want you to hold me accountable for being that person. I will not always be that person. I, I trust me, I won't always be that person. And I'd like to read that to you too, but I have to switch phones. You know you're important when you have too many phones. <laughs> It's another government thing. I just don't want the government to have my personal stuff, you know, mixing it gets messy. So this is my leadership philosophy that I share. I believe all relationships are built with respect as the foundation. As a leader, I will show respect to all with whom I interact. I strive to live my life with integrity and moral courage. Our last speaker talked about courage too, didn't she? As a leader, I will foster and reward these traits in others. I believe growth is a lifelong process. As a leader, I will continue to learn and grow, and I will enable those around me to do the same. I'm an eternal optimist, and I strive to see the good in all people and situations. As a leader, I will use this optimism to be an agent for positive change, to lift up and celebrate successes, <clears throat> and to focus forward in difficult times. As a fallible human being, I believe in grace and humility. I will serve those I lead with grace and humbleness. Finally, at the, I believe at the core of humanity, we are all look, striving for love and happiness. In my life, I live my life in pursuit of love and happiness in all that I do, and I will lead others to find love and happiness in their daily activities. Personal mission statement. That's what I want to live by. Again, I don't always live up to it, but I try. And then these other things, you hear them. These are good TED Talks, as she mentioned earlier. Be vulnerable. Let down your walls. Let people know. You have emotions, it's okay. Be authentic. And sometimes being authentic means you have to be brave and have courage to step out. And when you do, you're gonna find your life is so much richer. So just like our last speaker, go do something that puts a little fear into you and go do it with lots of joy and love and happiness in your life. And do it with people you love because you're gonna really enjoy life a lot more if you do. Now, I'm not doing what you should do for a close of a speech. I'm just gonna say, that's it. That's all the wisdom I've got. You've drained me of all the wisdom. So thank you.
we can do some questions now. I will have a little mic. I won't put it near your face, but I'm just going to get near you so we can hear it for the live stream as well. I answered it all. Uh, um, when you said like you took a year off between grad and undergrad, like between that time. Oh, I took more than a year. A couple of years. <laughs> um, driving you to go back to Jack Pass, was it really hard to get back into the emotions and things like that? And how did it take from what you learned from the Elliott School to put into the park, National Park? So the first part, it was about... 13 years between my undergrad to my grad school. So I had matured a lot. Didn't take much because again, the people here helped me ease into things really nicely. I felt really in a, a place that I fit, if that makes sense. So one of the pieces of wisdom is, you know, make sure you fit where you need to be. Don't force yourself into it. It doesn't work that well. So taking what I've learned in grad school and applying it in the park service, I think every day I use things that I learned here. I tell people, and I always say, I go into things, I said, I have a bias, but I believe communication is at the crux of everything. So everything I do on a daily basis, whether it's talking to a park partner or talking to one of my staff members, or if I'm lucky enough, I get to go out and talk to the public about you know, the resource, it draws on things I've learned here. A lot of it, honestly, I learned in Jeff's class. I mean, 535, I, I loved that class. I loved that class. Mm -hmm. But when you learn, you know, what do you, what's a good rule of thumb is to know your audience, right? And sometimes that's easier than it is in other times, especially in a national park place where, national park unit where, you know, you're getting people from all around. So you don't know what they're coming into your programs with. But you know, having the skill sets to know kind of how you can find that out and then using Aristotle's rules, <laughs> you know, I mean, Aristotle said it long ago, but I, I use those. I use those to deal, intera interact with groups and individuals daily. I, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, it's, it's, yeah. I will say it all to you as I do to everyone. It is my bias though. I know I come from this, that communication is key. It's the key thing to all relationships. Okay, um, so where do you see the journalistic writing that you learn apply in like your job and in areas of your job? The journalism? So I didn't really focus on journalism. I was more on the rhetoric side. But, but I think, and I'm a staunch, so I, I'm a very passionate person about federal service and federal employees. Another thing I'm very passionate about is a very strong um, press. And I think what, what I learned and what I preach is that Journalism, good journalism, is about good critical thinking and helping others to develop those good critical thinking skills, giving them the information so that they can make wonderful choices, right? Whatever those cho choices are. You know, you, you and I may not agree, say, on a political candidate, but good journalists and good journalism gives us the information so we can make that choice. But you have to be a good critical thinker as a journalist to be able to give that to other people. Just as you have to be a good critical thinker as a professor to help pass that on. So critical thinking. And writing. I mean, you know, that'd be a good writer. <laughs> Although, where's Madeline? I sent, when I sent Madeline my photo, I said I'm a big believer in the Oxford comma. All right, I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> Love the Oxford comma. I know that's not AP style, but that's okay. I really like your story about the resume. Um, so you said you're going to resist this opportunity. So what advice would you give to someone who is trying to differentiate between 
a job that they're in this thing that could be an opportunity, or would you say you just simply don't want to do it? Or would you say you just have to try? So I can only speak from my experience, but my barrier to that job was a preconceived notion of what I thought Mississippi was like, right? That was where my barrier was. So my advice to anybody is don't put up barriers. Uh, be more like a sponge or, I don't know, not, not coming up with a great analogy in the plant world. Don't they have like, you know, soak up things. Soak it up before you make a decision to resist. Because your preconceived notions of a place or of a job or of a, or people can keep you from really having some wonderful life experiences. And uh, I said this to Jessica, or yes, Jessica Newman, not the last Jessica, um, which gets confusing. Um, you know, lots of things are not life and death, right? Try it. If you don't like, you know, put in for the job. You'll know along the way if, you're, if it's supposed to fit. You know, you go through an interview process. It might not fit for you. And you might realize it somewhere down the line before you get the job. Or you might get in the job and you're like, yeah, not what I expected. It's not, you're not writing your signature in blood and giving yourself away to a job. It's a job. Start looking for another one. But don't resist things because of your preconceived notions. That's where I was resisting. And again, I faxed it two hours later, they offered me the job. If I kept resisting, my life may have gone in a totally different trajectory. I would not have known one of the skills that I was given or one of the gifts I think I was given to be able to write and, and to communicate. I don't know if that helps you, but don't put up barriers. There are enough of them out there. Don't make your own. <laughs> Come on, I know the parks people have questions about the parks. Yeah. No? You can ask me after. Hey, again, secret question. Yeah, the secret question. The secret handshake, I'll, I'll pass it on. I wish there was a secret handshake. All right, so no questions, Matt. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good job. Good job.